But just to give you a brief overview um, of what, what we are, who we are, what goes on, uh, we're a company called Lamp and Pencil. That comes from the two of us who started the company back in, right at the very beginning of 2015. I'm the lighting geek and Tamsin Higgins is the more creative person. Um, I can see a little twitch of a smile from Rob, who knows exactly what I'm saying there. Um, Tamsin comes from a background of exhibition design. She's qualified in uh, making costumes. She's got a furniture design degree. She's that person that makes everything look nice. And it also it gives us the ability when we're working with suppliers to, to come in with um, two, two options. Uh, one is the very technical side, and the other is the how, how it's actually going to work. So we can turn up with a scenic, uh, sorry, a costume supplier or a scenic supplier, and turns in can talk their language, which is great. That really helps us. Um, it's it's not particularly with costume people and props people when when electrical people walk into the room there's this look of terror on their faces because they know that you're gonna all of a sudden ask for something like a massive battery to be hidden in a tiny costume so the company was formed into early 2015 we got together uh, I'd, I'd been working at the opera house for a number of years doing the, the background stuff there, the kind of the systems stuff. Tamsin had been working as an exhibition designer, as a fully employed and now freelancer. And we decided that actually putting a company together and working together was what the industry needed. So we formed Lamp and Pencil. And the basic idea of Lamp and Pencil is if you can't buy it in a box, we'll build it. So people come to us with ideas. And then we take that idea and we make it into some form of reality. And that idea can be anything from the vaguest of the vague to a highly detailed sketch or proper full on specifications. We now have eight people working with us. Um, we've got a massive network of freelancers and subcontractors and suppliers as well that we've built up over time. And we, we operate out of three industrial units in Bishop Storford, which is by Stansted Airport. We've got a floor space now of over 500 square meters. And just to give you a rough idea of what we do, we, we hold over 40,000 different items in stock ready to go. So that when Rob or Tim or anyone else rings up with the next crazy idea, we're ready to get started on a lot of stuff, which gives us a really big um, benefit over some of our other competitors. We've got stuff on the shelf that's ready to go. And um, just so you know, we're working updating stuff at the moment but our stock value on the shelves is something like a quarter of a million pounds and that's just in the day-to-day -day stuff we use. One of the big confusions we face is what are set electrics and um, there's the very obvious stuff there's there's a sign from company there that lights up then there's the six set which is hugely set electrics heavy and there's a lot of set electrics in a very small space on that. Those are the obvious things we think about um, but we also get involved in all sorts of things like light up floors. Um, so the, the floor panel that's lit up there is only 18 millimeters thick because it had to match up with a piece of plywood. Um, we'll come back on to when you should involve us so that we don't get into these things having to be incredibly thin stages. Come back to that in a minute. Uh, and then there's a lift sign at the top. Uh, as the lift goes up and down in the production, the numbers change from white to red. And then there's a fashion show we did for Alex on Queen out in Paris there. All of the fluorescent tubes are custom. And with fashion, um, if, if you think that some of the technical specs in theatre are, are tight, then when you get into fashion, you'll be really surprised. We're looking at incredibly high CRIs, very specific uh, colour temperatures on LEDs, and, and absolutely repeatable as well. And they will light into everything and go around and check colour temperature on site as well. So, so the fashion world is quite an amazing one. We then have the stuff that people don't necessarily think of. So some examples, I'm hoping you can see the screen. If not, I'll put this presentation up later. And there's a little gas mantle there, and it looks very, very green in that photo because there's no frame of reference for the camera. But actually, we did a lot of work with a lighting designer in the UK who knows more about gaslight than I've, I've ever believed could exist. So we went through very specific timelines for the show and what type of gas would be used, whether it would be coal gas or natural gas, and that changes the colour of the flame. 
So we ended up with some very custom LED arrays in there to create that. We then have a book, and that book opens up and lights up. A lot of people forget about movement. So most of, most of the, the set electrics companies, the big four definitely, will, will provide movement solutions as well. We're not automation shops. Uh, I will make that very clear. We will do things that you want to control from the lighting desk, but it's not a fully fledged flying system or similar. So that book opens up, the light comes on. The idea is it was for a children's piece. Um, at the, the end of the show, the book sits on stage, lit up, and then the, the cover slowly closes and the light goes out. And then in the bottom left of the screen is a, is a hand lantern. These are our bread and butter work. The amount of people that come and ask us to, uh, to make things like this light up. It's great, we love it, battery powered. And then we have a couple of clocks. So you can see the, the one on the wooden backing there is actually, it's a, that was the prototype future clock. Um, so that spins around, it's completely indexable, controlled from the lighting desk. So you can either set it to run at a given speed, or you can set it to certain positions. And then the large one, the, the flat clock, was, was one for a show at the Royal Court a few years ago, um, where they, they wanted this very specific type of clock. And again, you can set the speed it operates at, run it continuously forwards or backwards, and set it to certain times and dates. And then there's the atmospheric stuff. So we end up with uh, people requesting smoke machines in all sorts of odd locations uh, with ducting and fans, anything from small chimneys or tiny magic effects through to some quite large uh, smoke machine arrays. The four you can see there were installed on Len Miz by, by Carl and his team. And everything in between. So set electrics is quite varied and it does cross over our fields. So we get to work with all sorts of amazing people. We've got the lighting team, the props team, scenic uh, costume, and everyone else as well. Um, we do also get involved in some very strange things. So here is something I've just picked up from the workshop today, which is an alien tentacle uh, that is, it actually moves, it's motor driven. So we will just about do anything. And that comes on to a very important point. Talk to us, always talk to us, involve us in what you're doing. Sadly, a lot of the work we do actually gets hidden away inside things, and I probably get far more excited than cable and connectors than I, I probably should. I, I don't get out a lot. I do spend a lot of time in the workshop. Um, so a lot of the work we do does get hidden away. There's some examples there of some, some LED drivers and bits and pieces built into scenery. And then the, the, the picture, that's sort of just about coming out on the, uh, the, the bottom right of the screen is a load of distribution boxes we did for Phantom of the Opera for the World Tour. Those distribution boxes, we just put power and data in, so Ethernet, and then that converts it to DMX, also controls relays inside the box, so you can individually switch each of the output power circuits and also uh, get DMX to your local fixtures. So there's quite a lot in there going on, and it just enabled them to tour all of that on the trusses so they didn't have a big dimmer city like in a traditional setup. Now, the idea stage. This is the bit that you guys do, and we can help you with it. But it tends to go one of two ways, and we do, we do see distinct camps. Some people have the most brilliant idea in the world ever. It's the most creative thing. It's, it's going to change the show. It's going to be the, the key piece of the show. But they get a little bit worried about talking. And some people, that's because they think we'll steal it uh, and sell it or we'll tell other people about it. Uh, but people get very worried about that others won't like it. And that is hard. And I have absolute respect for lighting designers who, or any, any creative designer who's putting their thoughts out there. It's their inner workings, their inner mind. So, so people do get very worried about what if people don't like it. Uh, there's a big concern about, I'm not going to say anything yet because I'll wait for the rehearsal process. To happen and then I'll see if I got it right because things might change in the rehearsal process. And then the other one is I haven't fully thought it through. That's very, very common. And don't worry, uh, all of these things are actually nothing to worry about. What I would say though, and we will go over this a few times in this presentation, please start talking to us early. The more you talk to us, the more we can help you um, between us and the, the other three of the big four and lots of other people around. There's a huge amount of experience in the industry. We've all got different experiences. The big four all have their 
their kind of their preferred things, the things that they're brilliant at, and then lots of other stuff. And then all of us have stuff that we don't do. So talk to us and see what we do do and what we don't do, and then we'll try and help you out. And I think it's fair to say there's there's at least two of us that work very closely together sometimes, and um, we're absolutely happy to turn around on both sides and say, you'd actually be better off going to this other company for this. That's no problem. Uh, and we do work together. We do stuff. But we're, although we pretend we, we don't like each other on the face of it, generally we, we're all right. We're not too bad. So that's one, what not to do. Don't worry. Don't get concerned by things. It's really helpful if you do talk to people straight away because you're going to get help in developing the idea. And we'll be able to advise tweaks that might make it easier or cheaper or more appropriate for what you're trying to achieve. So things like um, specifications that are very tight on exactly what type of LED tape we use. If we have to import that from America and pay to have it CE marked, you're going to get the bill for that. So if you can work with us and we can find an alternative that is already CE marked, for example, that's going to save you a load of time and money. Um, Give us time to explore it. Uh, a lot of quotes come in and people want a quote tomorrow, which is all very well, but we're not box shifters. We don't get this stuff off the shelf and sell it. So we have to sit down and work out how we're going to build it, what parts we're going to use. We need to talk to our suppliers and get all of that information together. It's quite an involved process. Um, and also, you want your best chance of your idea working properly on opening night. So the more time you can give us, the more testing we can do. Once we've built a prototype, we can thoroughly test it rather than being on this race to the finish. It is daunting to specify set electrics. We completely understand that. And that's not that's not we land competitor, that's we the big four. We get it. It's not easy. You're putting your ideas out there, you're coming to us, and you're asking for something that's never been built before. That's the nature of what most of this stuff is. It's, it's your own special idea. No one has done that show before in that format. You're aiming for something new and creative that hopefully the audience will go, wow, that was amazing. Good suppliers will help you work out what you need. That's really important to remember. You're not just coming to us to buy something. As Rob said, we work together. We're a team. We're there to help you. We'll sit down, we'll talk a lot, we'll work things out. And hopefully, again, sometime soon, we'll be able to sit down in a room together and actually discuss things face to face because that's one of the best bits. And that's one of the best things I think it, this industry has is we all sit down and we sit, sit down with the impossible and then we work out how to make it. And then you go and see the show and you see the audience reaction. And that's the best thing about the industry. Be open with us. Please, please, please do tell us what you're trying to achieve. Um, again, we get a whole mix of different specifications. Some are very technical and will just tell us exactly what tape you want or what products you want and how you want it configured. Some will have all of the wiring diagrams and some will even go as far as telling us exactly what cable we must use. Um, that's all very well and we can build to that exact specification. But if you can tell us what you're trying to achieve with it, then we can we can look at the creative side as well. So as we're building it, we can be thinking about will it achieve what you want. If you do have technical preferences or requirements, tell us. Again, just be open. If you really, really like a particular brand of wireless transmitter, that's fine. We, we are dealers for one type. We will use any of the others. It's not a problem. Um, whatever's most appropriate for you whoever's been around selling to you, that's absolutely fine. We'll work with you. Do tell us about external influences as far as you can. So the biggest problems we face on site tend to be uh, where we've just got a, a very small information set to work with. So we've just been told about one very small piece of scenery, as opposed to seeing the whole uh, set of scenic drawings and also information from audio and video suppliers as well. The more you can tell us, the more we can actually step in and help you out. We can look at the way things will interact and the way that things can work together. As suppliers, we not all communications have to go through you. We will always keep you copied in. But we're absolutely happy to talk to other suppliers as well directly if that's appropriate. So it may be we've, we've done sets here before where we've integrated the audio into the set. And we've, we've done that on behalf of the sound company. So we, 
we work with them to work out what cabling and other requirements they have. Even things like knowing if there are guitars on stage. So um, I don't think it's bad to tell you, but with six, we have a big problem with guitar pickups on the Rostra set. The LED tape on the Rostra set is the perfect length to provide an aerial, an antenna, that emits radiation at exactly the frequency that some guitar pickups react to. So by knowing if you've got guitars on stage, that's, that appears to be completely useless information to us, but actually it's something that we can then think about. It allows us to add a bit of extra shielding in, we use a different type of cable, we can ground the, the extrusion that the LEDs in, um, on the six set, we put a load of foil tape on now that we, we bond to earth so that we, we reduce the amount of interference going out. And we also change the frequency that the drivers run at. So by knowing all of that information, we can make decisions before you get to site and have a problem again. Um, set design and construction is always important. If you can tell us what materials the scenic companies are using, that's good to know. Um, Things like fiberglass, we try not to drill through. So if we know that it's a fiberglass set, we'll try to make sure that the scenic company has all the drawings in advance and they form the holes into the piece rather than us having to deal with nasty, nasty fiberglass dust. And again, set builders, we know most of them, we work together, we're all quite happy really. Uh, so, so we're willing to take on those conversations, keeping you up to date. And then do you tell us if things are part of the action. So. Things like a, we're looking at a bottle that needs to light up. It's a, it's a spirit bottle that just needs to, to glow. And if that's being put on the shelf, that's one thing. That's a very simple build. And actually, we've been told that this one is going to be thrown between cast members as part of the action, as part of the choreography. So straight away, we know that we need to, to build that more robustly. Uh, we also need to think about repair and replacement because inevitably, the cast aren't going to catch it every time, are they? We know what they're like. They will try. They will try. As Rob said as well, we need to know where the show's going. If you're going to install this once, and it is a single install, and then it's going to come out and be scrapped, we can put things in using less connectors. Every connector costs money and takes time. So we can build a lot more um, cost saving into a set that's going to stand still. If it's going to tour, how often is it going to move? Is it a, a two or a three monthly move? Or is it a, it's going in for two nights and then moving? Where is it going to is important. If it's around the UK, that's great. We know the standards in the UK. We know the line voltage, for example. Uh, and we know the way that our crews work. If it's going out into Europe, we're going to have to think about European conformance. We're going to have to think about the way the European crews work and venues operate. Even the way that circuits are wired, so electrical circuits within buildings, varies between countries to an extent, and we have to factor all of that in. And then if it's going further afield, we need to start considering dual voltages, for example. So a show, a show that's going to the UK, Europe, and America, we'll need to make sure all of our power supplies are dual voltage so that they work for the whole tour. You don't get to America and have to swap everything out. Things like incandescent lamps. We have some that we wire in parallel for the US and some that we wire in series. Again, if you think of six with the, the, the DWE lamps in the portal, those are 120 volts. So in, in the US, they get wired in parallel. In the UK, they get wired in series. If we know that your show set is starting in the UK and going to America, we will make sure that the wiring is easy to change and we'll include instructions for doing it when we give you the, the as-built manual. Going further afield, we get into all sorts of things as you go around the world. Um, so Canada's a, one we've got a show going to shortly, where we have to have everything checked in the UK. Once we've built it, we have to have a very exciting chat with the clipboard come around and verify that we can conform to the Canadian electrical legislation. And that has to be done here. If you're shipping anything to Canada, the, the approval has to be done here before you can unload it the other end. Uh, anyone plugging anything in that hasn't been CUL approved out there actually faces a prison term. So that's pretty severe. So knowing these things is quite useful. Um, talking to us as well, because as we do more shows, we get more experience. So coming to us saying, I've got a show going to Canada, actually we could impart some of our knowledge to you, which can be quite helpful. And then the big question, when do you need it? That's a tricky one to answer sometimes. 
completely accept that. What we're after is when you actually need it. If you had a few weeks on because you worked with other suppliers who were maybe a little bit slower uh, and tend to not meet their deadlines, you can quite often add a couple of weeks on just to give yourself some breathing room. That's fine. But if you can tell us when you want it and when you need it, that's really useful information for us to have. We will always aim to get it to you within your wanted date, not your needed date. And do bear in mind the way we try to work is to get everything ready in advance so that we've got time to test it. Gives you time to come to us, check what we've done is right and that you like it and that it's not doing something weird. It may be you come in and you just go, actually, I think I got that design wrong. Um, can we change it? That's a lot easier in the workshop than the theatre. We do have people get caught out as well. So we've had specifications where it said RGB uh, warm white, I think it was. And then we got to site. And when the lighting designer turned up after the show had been installed in the venue, they said, I meant cold white. Can we change it? Which actually, when it's 120 meters of LED tape, that's really hard to do. Interestingly, just, uh, there's some light. Sorry about that. Um, what's your budget? Budgets are very important to us. Um, it gives us an idea of what sort of technology we're going to use. If you're working on a very low budget show, be honest with us. We have ways of achieving things for cheaper prices. You will find that it will either take longer or the reliability might be less but you'll be able to make that choice. If you come to us asking for everything and we do you a quote and then you fall off your chair and turn around and say we can't afford that, that's wasted everyone's time. So it takes a long time for us to quote. And also it's maybe lost you a bit of time in your design process and thought process. So do be honest about the budgets. We don't need exact figures at that point and we're not going to hold you to it. All we need to know is what, what level of production are we aiming for? We do work for everyone from very small regional theatres uh, and even individuals who are touring one-person one shows right through to some of the biggest worldwide shows. So knowing where we're pitching is useful and then we can talk about how we're going to achieve that. And do remember this, supplies all have specialisms. So there will be times that you'll come to us and we'll either suggest that you, you could try someone else or we'll suggest that we bring in someone else as a subcontractor so, for example, we work with a company called Triple E a lot, who do a lot of mechanical engineering for the stage. And we also work with some other mechanical engineers who are far more set up and they have a bigger product range in that area and can support you better than we can ourselves. So we'll bring people in uh, to, to support whatever you want us to do. But, but bear in mind when you're looking at quotes particularly, one, one quote may be very expensive because one company may have to develop a lot more equipment to do what you need than another company. Do you consider import, uh, sorry, do you consider import requirements? And particularly with Brexit looming, we've, we've all been working on the, the Brexit scenario since it, it was muted a long time ago now. Uh, it does have quite a big impact on us. There will be delays at ports because our shipments are small and our industry doesn't have the funds to suddenly pay customs authorities to fast track stuff through, our stuff is going to be delayed. Um, we're also going to see problems with compliance. So compliance is that little CE mark that you see on things. I'm looking around for something in here that has it on. Uh, so this, this LED tape pack here has a little CE mark on it. So this one here and also an RAHS mark. Those are compliance marks, so CE is the one we use in Europe at the moment. Uh, it's about meeting the requirements of standards. We all have to do it when we make stuff. There's, there's no getting out of it, even if you're a one-person well, one freelancer working out of your shed, whatever you build has to meet local legislation. Um, and also other standards in the UK, we have British and currently European standards. Um, CE is a bit of a problem because when we break it, uh, C will no longer apply to us. It can't. It's not allowed to because of the structure of it. So we will have to come up with something else. Uh, there was UK CA that was muted, uh, and that's sort of been shelved for now, which is concerning. So we're not sure what's happened there. Um, when we're talking about touring shows abroad as well, compliance is very important to us because we need to make sure that when your set gets to America, for example, when they're unloading it from the containers, 
but they've got all the relevant UL paperwork to take it off. If some of that is missing, there have been sets impounded because the paperwork isn't there or the standards aren't met and the compliance paperwork isn't correct. So we do need to think a little bit about that. All of these exciting things you never thought about with set electrics. So back to some more interesting stuff. Specifications. Uh, this is a specification that we received. Um, I can't see you, but I'm hoping a lot of you are chuckling and um, possibly one or two of you know where this came from. And um, you're going to get feedback on it. That is, that is a specification that we received to make a spinning top that was motorized and tracked across the stage. That's actually not a bad specification. It's a, it's a quick sketch, it's an idea, it's what they thought of. And that was given to us with a conversation. Uh, back back pre-COVID, this was a face-to-face uh, -face conversation. We were given a sketch, we had a chat about it. And what was great was actually, this didn't tie us down technically too much. So we were then able to come away and think about it and come up with how we were actually gonna do it and then present that back to the customer. So a simple sketch is all, sometimes all of the specification we need. Not always, nice to have a bit more. And then the other end of the specification scale is something like this. So this is actually, you'll, you'll recognize six here, hopefully, the, the frames. This is a specification that's come in because the, the show's been done on Broadway now. So this is the as built from Broadway effectively. So we know a lot more. So within this information here, we've got a clear layout of what they're trying to achieve. So we can see the whole picture of these pieces. This did come in a pack of information as well. So we've got everything. We've got all of the scenic drawings. We've got the whole stage layout. Even things like having a plan of the venue, like the hanging plot, is really, really useful because we can see how things interact. So things like can we share network switches between different items and so on. Tucked away in that specification, that, that drawing, because drawings are absolutely the best way of transferring information quickly. There's actually a load of detail here. So on this one, every individual pixel is drawn. That's very, very key. You don't need to always go to that level. And if you are modeling up pixels, please model them as simple as not. Don't draw them individually, because it takes loads of time to render. And um, this one tells us how many pixels are in each string. Uh, it's, they've used colors to give us an indication of where the pixel runs go. That's really helpful. And then there's some curvy lines that show how they'd like it wired. Again, that's really useful because that means that when we build it, we will wire the pixels in the same order that they've got them on Broadway. So when they come into us, they can use the same show file. They haven't got to repatch every single pixel on the frames because stuff has moved around. And that saves everyone time. That's, that's very, very helpful. Also tucked away down in that drawing is a load of information about the actual products they used. If you've got preferences, that's brilliant. Tell us. So these, there's a, there's a little line at the top that says any vendor and some RGB color nodes, 2811 color nodes. That's brilliant. That just tells us enough. We know what they are. And it just says that we can buy them from anywhere. And then there's some information about the control equipment, which says it comes from NTEC. Um, on the, on the spec sheet there, it says NTEC Americas. Obviously, we, there's some bits we automatically translate. You don't have to worry too much. We're not going to buy it from America. We'll buy that from NTEC UK. It will be the same product. And then some other bits. There's always the AliExpress thing. That's a very, uh, very popular one on scenic specifications now. Things like AliExpress are great. If you can send us links to products you like or you've chosen, but bear in mind, work with us because we've got stock on the shelf. We hold a lot here. Uh, our LED tape, we're not in the lie, it comes from China, um, the, mostly. It's the same as any of the other stuff. Uh, we have our suppliers that we like working with. We know their quality, we know their lead times, and we know the way they work. So that enables us to deliver you a better product more reliably. Uh, if you do have something specific though, you, you particularly want to use Ray Wu uh, there, that's fine, we'll buy from them, it's not a problem. The actual project process does confuse people as well, because quite often people will give us an idea and then at the other, then they'll get asked for some money uh, and then at the other end, they'll get their product. With general stuff, the way a project generally works is there's some sort of idea in the beginning. 
that feeds into some discussion, design, development, and planning. And then that feeds into the first prototype stage. And once you've built your first prototype, you then go back to more discussion, client discussion, internal discussion. You refine all of the parameters, and then you build another prototype. And for a typical product, for a domestic product, so think about your washing machine, there'll be many, many, many steps of this process. There'll be many iterations. There'll be lots of prototypes. 10, 20, even more prototypes is not uncommon. We then go to client approval of the final prototype. That final prototype goes into compliance testing, which takes weeks and weeks and weeks, and then production testing. Uh, we actually start building the production runs, and then we go into delivery. That's lovely for most of the world, but entertainment isn't most of the world. So what we tend to find is you want your quote here, right at the top, as we've started talking about it and thinking about the design, before we've really gone to the planning, you need a, a figure before we know if we've got the work or not. So that's a bit tricky. So when you get your quote, that's the stage we're quoting at. So we are open to discussion later, obviously. And then we miss out this whole middle stage. What we tend to do is we tend to have one set of discussion, design, development, and planning meetings. Then we'll build a prototype. We'll send some information through very quickly and check it's OK. Um, hopefully, we can get someone from the, the production to come and have a look in our workshop. But then we go straight from prototype to final production. We don't have all of this middle bit. We don't have the to and fro and finessing of the design. So we're always trying to get everything right first time. That does mean what you're receiving in the delivery stage is, is what is called in the rest of the world a production prototype. It is the first production batch. So there could be niggles. Uh, we do try to get everything right, but all of us, all of the big four and every other set electric supplier in the world will have things that don't work first time. The more time you can give us, the earlier you can talk to us and start us thinking about ideas, the better. Do remember that you are asking for something generally that has never been done before. So actually, we do need as much time as possible to try it out have a bit of prototyping time, build one, test it, and then build your final ones. So please, please, please give us lots of time, as much as you can. Do you start talking early, that's, that's key. Do be honest about what you don't know as well as what you do know. If you're not sure about something, please, please, please just tell us. Say, I think it's gonna be this, but I'm not sure. That's absolutely fine. We just like to know roughly where we're at. And then we can come back to you with more questions. Um, do share drawings with us. There is a big fashion, uh, particularly in the UK recently, of just sharing the set electrics drawings with us. The more you can share with us, the better. So most of the worldwide productions we do, we actually get everything. We get access to a Dropbox or a similar type link that gives us access, read-only access, to all of the scenic drawings, costume drawings, props, information about the shows, some of the director's notes about things and everything else. That's really helpful for us because it can eliminate some of the little niggle, niggling questions that come up. We can actually log on and see why there's an issue with clearance on a particular piece of scenery, for example. We can then think about it, see if we can do anything before coming back to the production team with the requirements. We do keep up to date with people. We do keep in touch. That's one of our big things. We try to make sure that we have regular conversations with you. So during that stage, don't worry if we've got access to all the drawings. It's not so that we can go and do our own thing in our own little box away from you. It's very much about being involved and part of that team that Rob was talking about earlier. The more involved everyone can be, the better. It means that we head off problems before we get to the venue. And um, quite often, we're, we're all experienced. We've all got lots of uh, different uh, experience behind us. So quite often we'll see things that someone will say, oh, have you thought about that? Uh, it might be that the automation company goes, well, oh, actually, you need to think about that cable drop there because that's going to get snagged by this piece of scenery. So we do tend to help each other out. Please do be open about your budgets. That is important. If you know that it's a mega show and you've got loads of money in, and uh, money is no concern, if you find one of those, we'd love to work on it. That'd be great. Um, but we do know that budgets are often limited please, please, please be honest about us. And, and also, if you know things like you've got an overall budget and you've got to balance things in that budget, again, just be open with us and talk to us because we may be able to work with other suppliers on that. 
it's not uncommon for us to go in and bid with a senior company, for example. So our costs are combined. Um, we're also we're able to rent out kit. So if you don't have the money to buy all the kit, it may be that we can rent the control gear to you. That's quite a common one now uh, to, to eliminate some of the upfront costs, particularly on short shows. So it might be a show, a corporate job that's only happening for a week or even one night. And actually, you just want to rent all the control gear and just buy the consumables. That's fine. We can talk about it. And then do talk about alterations. Be open to our alterations and our suggestions, but also report back as soon as you hear something's changing somewhere else in the production. So maybe a, a set element has had to change because the set construction company found, found a problem with the way it's constructed. Do feed that back as quickly as you can and as openly as you can. And then the last one, don't be scared about the technology. Um, as you've probably noticed, I don't get out a lot. I spend a lot of time with a lot of technology. Um, that's what I do. I'm not, I'm not particularly creative in the way a lot of lighting designers are, but that's my part of the role. So we know a lot about the technology. We know what controllers we like to use. We know what type of wire we like to use and what type of other products we like to use. We can give you samples of stuff. We hold a huge amount here. You're welcome to come and see stuff when you're thinking through ideas. We often get lighting designers coming in to talk through ideas before a show is even officially out for bid. So they'll be able to have a look at stuff and try it out before they, before they make any decisions about what they might want to suggest. So the technology side is moving forward quickly as well, and we try to keep up to, up to date with it. But do, do suggest your own things. If you have particular things you like, then come and talk to us. Then the do nots. There's a, only a couple of do nots. And one of the things is that please, please don't ask for loads of quotes on big complex items. There are a limited amount of set electrics companies in the UK, and we're all very keen to work with, with lots of people and do amazing projects. But quoting does take up a huge amount of time. Uh, we don't, we're not bemoaning quoting at all. Quoting is an important stage, and that's not a problem. But if you're asking everyone to quote for one element, or you're coming back to the same supplier asking for lots of quotes for similar elements as you develop it, then that can take up a lot of time. And that does get reflected in your end price, I'm afraid, because it's time we have to account for. Then that doesn't stop you coming to us for discussions. We can talk about stuff. You might just you might get a ballpark figure as opposed to an actual quote uh, just to help you through the initial stages. And please, 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 as Rob said earlier, don't base your choices purely on the lowest price. That's absolutely a false economy. What you'll tend to find is that when you get four quotes in, you'll find that quite often that one is low, one is high, and two are sort of similar. The two similar ones kind of indicate that that's probably the spec you, you're going for. The one that is, has come in very quote could be that someone's missed something. But it's worth going back and asking the question. So we've had it previously where we've bought, we've had to buy a minimum order quantity of Cavisham lamps, for example, the little LED fairground lights. And we had to buy a thousand of them for a job where we needed 120. So actually then we're looking for another job to put them on so we can ship them out very cheap. So we quoted another job, which we came in very cheap on. And we actually got a phone call from the production electrician saying, why are you so cheap on this element? Once we explained it, then there. Uh, then they came back to us and we actually won that element, which was great. Um, but I do still have a lot of LED cabochon lamps if anyone needs any. Um, they're quite, quite big on the shelf. When you've awarded the work, as Rob said earlier, we keep talking. Um, we become phone buddies or Zoom buddies or whatever the new technology is. And we do try and meet up in person as often as, uh, as possible as well. Um, ongoing communication is vital. Things do change. Uh, drawings change, certainly. Please do share uh, drawings, and not just in PDF format, because quite often we want to take measurements from them as well as everyone else. So PDFs are great, but we also like the um, native formats, so Vectorworks or AutoCAD or whatever else you're using. Keep in touch and be prepared to remain open-minded. So if it's particularly something, something complicated, then we may well find that we develop a bit and then we need to come back to you for some more ideas. We need to, to, to finesse the design. And that might require a few alterations to bits and pieces. Um, so knowing what you're trying to achieve is really important there. Do remember that you're asking us to build the only one of these in the world. Um, 
it's new for all of us. So it's your idea. It's fantastic. It is going to be the best thing in the world. But we just we need a little support to get there. And then we're going to finish up with a little bit on technologies. So, so some of the things we use are LED tape. That's that's a common one. We use all sorts of different light emitters, um, tungsten lamps, every type of uh, metal halide lamp. Fluorescent tubes are still quite popular in some circumstances, and everything in between. Uh, we also do a lot with motors, servo motors, DC motors, and then big AC motors for moving heavier things. And then even simple things like relays, switching stuff on and off. As a supplier, we, we can provide as much as you want. So we can provide from the control system right through to the end, or we can just supply the end bit. It's up to you. That's about talking to us and, and just determining what the scope of work is. Uh, we're going to concentrate on a couple of the really common things that people specify, just so you've got some information. And I'm going to put these specification file, uh, documents in the in the Dropbox a bit later, so you can all see them and you can download them and see what you should be getting from your suppliers. It's really important to get a good specification doc, uh, document for the products you're going to use. The documents we provide for LED tape include things like the brightness and lumens, uh, and and also the the actual wavelength of the light that's coming out of each colour and the colour temperature range. You'll find with LED products they can vary greatly between what for example, a red is. You can get quite a deep red or you can get quite a, a light red, and that can be very important, particularly if you've got a show you've already programmed elsewhere in the world and you're bringing it to the UK, to not have to change those, those programming states too much is, is always very helpful. The key things with LED tape that we need to know are things like colours. Do you want a warm white, a cold white, a natural white, an ultra white, um, RGB? RGB white, what type of white do you want with the RGB? RGB warm white, cold white, do you need amber in there? There's hundreds of combinations that you can have. So come and talk to us and see what you want. And again, if you're stuck with what you want, try and visit us and you can play with a load of samples on the bench here and see what's going to get you the colours you want. And we did have a lighting designer come to us recently asking for a very specific peacock blue. And because everyone's eyes are different and it's also important to involve the designer at that stage. The way we work is that we either send a sample kit to them, uh, which we did because of the current scenario, or they can come into us and they can play around with a little console with faders on and check that they can definitely get the colours that they want out of that LED product. It's far better to do it then than be disappointed on stage. We then talk about width. So the width of the tape, we can supply LED tape with widths from 5 millimetres to 12 millimetres. And the width of the actual physical tape on the back. So that's this bit. So, so the width of that does have some impact on what we can supply. So we can't supply a particularly high power tape on a very narrow PCB without putting a big heat sink be behind it. Um, we then need to know a little bit about voltage. So if you're doing a battery operated piece of scenery, if you're just operating on 12 volts, then we'll use a 12 volt tape. But generally we'll try and use a 24 because we get less voltage drop across it, so we get less colour shift along the tape. And then LED size and, and numbers per metre. I'm going to hold this up, and I don't know if you'll be able to see it. So this particular tape has 240, um, they're called 2835 LED chips per metre. So you can see that they're all very close together, but they're quite small chips. So they don't emit as much light as a bigger chip, but because we can get them closer together, they give us some benefits. Um, You'll see as well these little copper pads. These are where we can cut the tape. So on this tape, we can cut 25 millimeter sections of it. But other tapes, we can only cut 100 millimeter sections, which when you're trying to do a set where you've got um, particularly small sections or bits have to finish in exact locations, we need the shortest cut length possible so that we don't get gaps. The number of LEDs per meter is, is useful. That's predominantly uh, useful for how much of a continuous line of light you want. So this one has 240 LEDs a meter. Um, this other example here that I'll just show you. Uh, it's very strange talking to you, I'm not been able to see you, but hopefully it's okay. And um, this is what's called a cob tape. So it's actually got the 
and it was an LED phosphor. And underneath that is, is loads of blue LEDs. This one is 700 LEDs a meter. Tiny, tiny LEDs. But when you light them up, it causes the phosphor to glow, which gives you an even line of light. Um, these tapes we can only do in versions of white at the moment because of the phosphor material on the top. Uh, and once you've got it, you can't change it because it's, it's that sort of rubbery phosphor on the top that gives it the, the light in the two boxes. Um, the spec sheet that's up on the screen is actually one for this tape. Uh, this uses something called a 3535 chip. So the 3535 chip, the, it's, it's a square and it's, the 35 re relates to inches, bits of inches. So the chip we looked at before was a 3528. Um, one dimension is the same on this, the so 35 and the other dimension is now bigger. So these are square chips as opposed to rectangular, but it's the same spacing. So these are 240 LEDs a meter. Um, this particular tape is phenomenally bright. When you look at the data sheet, it's uh, something like over, just over a thousand lumens of blue light will come out of that tape per meter, which is just insane. Um, it's a fairly new product to us, and um, it's, it's going to make quite a big difference for set electrics and uh, how much space we actually need to get panels of light in. And think about the ingress protection as well. Ingress protection is uh, protection against dust and moisture. So the tapes we've looked at so far are all IP20. They're fairly dust resistant because the circuit board has a coating over the top. We can also do IP67 and 68 tapes, which are fully waterproof as long as they're installed correctly. So if you're doing something outside, you're definitely need to, going to need a waterproof tape because water and LED tape do not work well to the solder joints and everything else corrode very quickly and it goes horribly, horribly wrong. One thing we do see when we go to see other people's work occasionally, not from the big four, I'll just uh, put that out there, but we do see other people's work that we've been asked to come and help fix or take from a very small touring rural show to, to a, a bigger international tour. Um, LEDs tape does need to be fed from something called cell supplies or from batteries. You can't use just any old type of power supply with it for safety reasons. That's really important. Um, if you need advice on that, please do come back to us later and we can explain a bit more a bit outside the scope of today. Though. Um, and that's a bit of an example of times where sometimes we will get a very precise spec that tells us what power supplies to use, but they're not, they're not safe to use. If you specify it, you do take on some responsibility for that specification, although we will always flag it up and we'll bring it to your attention. Um, what you can't see on that, uh, that's that page, but you will see on the, the documents I upload to Dropbox is there'll be a little compliance section as well. In the UK and Europe at the moment, we just need to worry about CE and ROHS, which is Restriction of Hazardous Substances, which just means that we and the other manufacturers of any product have not used anything horrifically dangerous in the product or it's in such small quantities that we don't have to worry about it. For electronics, the predominant one is lead. We're not allowed to use much lead anymore. So hopefully that's kind of a, a bit about LED tape. Um, we also then get some pixel tape. Uh, pixel tape just means that we can control the LEDs individually. Um, I, thought, so I thought I had a little sample here, but I've, I've left it on, on the other desk. Um, so pixel tape, we can control every LED or every three LEDs or every group of 10 LEDs together. So depending on the protocol you use and the way that the chips are set up on the board, we can control different groups of LEDs. And you can, can, you can cut this tape every group of LEDs, whether that's one, three, six, or 10. With this, again, you need to tell us what colors you want. Predominantly, pixel tape is either white, so a single white, you can choose which white. It's a dual white, uh, dual white and amber, RGB or RGB white. Other colors are available, and we can have chips custom made. That's no problem at all but you need to be on a big budget show for that. Um, we have had LEDs made to particular colors before, so very specific wavelengths. That was for an artistic piece. Um, it's absolutely possible, but the minimum order quantities are big and, uh, and we have to pay all of the tooling fees. So it can get quite expensive quite quickly. Again, with pixel tape, we can choose widths and voltages. The protocol is, is a bit like DMX. It's the, the pixel flavors of DMX. There's there's hundreds of different protocols out there. Some are compatible, some are not. 
Uh, some are compatible on some controllers, but not on other controllers. So again, come to us for advice there. Come to people who deal with it a lot. And we can talk you through some of the, the possible pitfalls and hopefully help you avoid them. Uh, we get choices of LED size, the number of LEDs per or pixels per meter. The cut interval vary, can vary. And ingress protection, obviously, again, if you're outside. All you're doing is show you like singing in the rain and you're trying to make some footlights. Please choose a waterproof one. And tell us what the scenario this kit's being used in is. And, and then the, the last two exciting ones about power supplies, batteries, and compliance again. And we do have a huge uh, array of pixel products that we can choose. Um, we, we have off the shelf, so these RGB bullets that are very, very popular at the moment. Um, we're buying those in hundreds of thousands at the moment, just to give you an idea of how popular they are. And then pixel panels. And we can also do custom products. So this, this animation that's sort of juddering through uh, is, a, is a custom that we, we built last week, and it's going to be built into a glove. It's going to go in the palm of the glove. And there's also little tiny fingerboards as well that, that go in the fingers of the glove. So the palm, whole palm will be able to illuminate and be pixel mapped, so we can do some really amazing effects across that. And different LED protocols do have pros and cons, so some are quite slow. Refresh rates can be quite slow. If you can tell us if your production is going to be filmed, we'll make sure that you're going to get a camera-compatible pixel product. That's quite important. So some, some refresh too slow or a bit juddery on camera, so we'll make sure you've got the right stuff. And so pixel products, we absolutely can build to whatever you want. And then another one we do commonly use this is predominantly in costume type work is fiber optic. Uh, we seem to be doing a lot of fiber optic dresses at the moment. Fiber optic you can get in different types. So we've got a side emitting one, which is very popular for doing lines of light, and then end emitting as well. The, the actual length of the fiber doesn't light up too much. It does glow slightly, but the end is very bright. So that's more of your starry kind of sparkly effect. And when we get specifications, we do range from the tablet. The, the technical stuff to, I want something sparkly in this dress. That's fine, just come and talk to us and we can interpret those as we go. Um, fiber optic is great, but do think about the light sources. They tend to be quite bulky. And also the fibers don't do well in long flowing costumes. If you've got a quite stiff, rigid costume, it works brilliantly for that, or a piece of scenery, that's fine. But as the costume moves, if it's a lightweight chiffon fabric or sort of a mesh or a net, um, the the, the actual fiber itself is going to stop that, that costume doing its proper thing and you will be hated by the costume department. You get quite fixed. So we can, we can help you work with the right fiber sizes to get the right things. Um, recently as well, there have, have been a, a, a load of products re reduced, uh, sorry, released by a company called Down Corning who have been specialists in the communications fiber industry for years. So we use them a lot when we install net networking equipment around buildings, we use down corning fiber. But recently they've introduced this, and this is actually lit up at the moment, so that red glow is, is from a laser source. And these little laser sources are quite, quite small. Um, that one's measuring about 12 millimeters in diameter, and the whole assembly, that length there, is about 70 millimeters long. So it's giving us a very intense light down a very, very fine fiber. This, this fiber here, is um, so that reflection on it, which is where it's not reflecting so much. And that little fibre is about a millimetre in diameter. And it's great because it's really, really flexible and I can tie in quite a tie knot. And that's great for costume because it means that as the fabric moves, this will move with it. That's probably the worst demonstration and I'm glad the actual official Versaline people aren't here with, with us on this because they the throttle us. But it is quite impressive if I unplug that field up, you see that very darker. So you can see how much light is coming out of that. So that's quite an impressive product. I will say that is for the higher budget shows at the moment. The little kit we have with just a few samples and bits and pieces is, is nearly £2,000. So that's for, for three emitters and four pieces of fibre, just to give you an idea. But it's very impressive. Again, if you want to come and see these things, uh, we're open to visitors. So that's my little slideshow done. Uh, death by PowerPoint. Hopefully it wasn't. Um, hopefully